We'll call the uh, Government Operations Committee to meeting to order. Sorry, we're starting a little bit late, but the previous committee ran late this morning, so we're just getting everything shuffled around here. Um, find my agenda here. First member or agenda on the bill is uh, Representative Simon's bill, H House File 350. Representative, uh, uh, I'll move that. Where's it go? I move that House File 350 be. A be passed and moved to the Housing Committee. Representative Simon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to be back, as always, before the Government Operations Committee. I really appreciate it. House File 350 um, has to do with a, uh, with, with a couple of really strong tools that cities have had since 1996, and in some senses before that, but certainly in this statute since 1996, to revitalize themselves, which is Obviously, um, a very important issue these days, particularly for communities like mine that are suburban communities, where um, uh, redevelopment, as much or more as development, is really the name of the game. Uh, before 1996, individual cities would have individual bills passed for purposes of special service districts or housing improvement areas. So we'd have a patchwork in the statutes of one-time kind of grants of authority to cities, like one of my cities, uh, Hopkins, was one of the first uh, to use it pre-1996, and there were these patchwork of sort of special bills passed. But after 1996, this legislature decided to standardize and make more uniform the practice by which both of these districts are allowed to exist. Um, but there were some limitations, uh, which others will talk about today, and this bill seeks to remove those limitations and give all cities really the freedom to, to use these tools um, indefinitely. Of course, the legislature is always free in any event, to come in, to intervene, to restrict or even stop the availability of this authority. So this wouldn't change that, obviously. Uh, the buck stops with the legislature. But, uh, Mr. Chair and members, if I may, I'd like to turn it over to the real experts, and I'd like to start with uh, Charlie Vanderarty from uh, Metro Cities, who's here, and uh, he can flesh out some of the details and tell you a little bit, little bit more about the bill. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Charlie Vanderarty for Metro Cities, an association of 84 cities across the seven county metro area. And I have the pleasure of working with the League of Minnesota Cities on House File 350 before you today. As Representative Simon noted, Minnesota cities have used housing improvement area and special service district authority to assist commercial landowners and homeowners who wish to make improvements. Over 15 cities across the state have used special service districts 
improving the economic vitality of retail corridors, including downtown shopping districts. And at least 10 cities have established housing improvement areas, allowing homeowners to protect their homes by repairing roofs and residential building exteriors. Cities get involved when property owners uh, are seeking to assess themselves for these improvements. And actually, I have a number of city officials here today to speak to you about their city's experiences. First will be Michelle Schnitker from the city of St. Louis Park. She's a housing supervisor, and she'll discuss their city's use of housing improvement areas. And I also have Mark Sather, city manager of White Bear Lake, who will share how his city has used the, their special service district. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the tape and uh, proceed with your testimony. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair and Government Operations Committee members. My name is Michelle Schnitker, and I am the Housing Supervisor for the City of St. Louis Park. I'm here today in support of House File 350, which would repeal the sunset provision of the housing improvement areas. The City of St. Louis Park has utilized housing improvement areas as an effective financing tool to assist with the preservation of the city's townhome and condominium housing stock. Housing improvement areas uh, Financing has allowed homeowners of properties belonging to homeowner associations to borrow money from the city at reasonable terms to update common area improvements. The loans are paid in whole or in part from the fees imposed on the properties within the area and collected with the property tax payments. The city of St. Louis Park has approximately 45 townhome and condominium associations. We have a total of about 3,500 3, units in these condominium associations, which comprises about 15% of our city's housing stock. This is an aging housing stock. The majority of these buildings were built in the 70s and 80s. And at 30 to 40 years old, many of these properties have rehab and deferred maintenance needs. Seeing a need to pre preserve this housing stock in our community, the first housing improvement area was established in St. Louis Park in 2002. Since that time, we have established six additional housing improvement areas um, at the request of the homeowner associations. A total of $12.6 million has been reinvested in nearly 1,100 units citywide in our community. And the projects have been very diverse, varying in size from 20 to 280 units. Housing improvement areas addressed a number of challenges faced by our homeowner associations. These challenges included underfunded reserves, low association fees, residents with modest incomes that need affordable payments for improvements. Many of the associations lack professional management over the years and have also lacked um, board expertise. They've lacked long-term planning. Often the bylaws restrict the amount of internal assessments or they have an inability to pass assessments. And also associations have no collateral. All of the HIA in, um, in St. Louis Park were rejected by at least two lenders due to low reserves low estimated market values, and low operating budgets. Their property values are declining due to the property's condition, and some homeowners cannot sell units due to being upside down on their mortgages. For homeowner associations, housing improvement area financing offers a competitive loan rate, a fixed long-term loan, affordable payment options. They can either pay up front or they can have annual payments, and a loan that is applied to individual owners. For the city, housing, finance, or housing improvement area financing offers a low risk means to maintain and preserve the city's townhome and condominium housing stock and stabilize neighborhoods. Requirements in the development agreement ensure that the association remains well managed, financially solvent, and maintains adequate reserves to meet future rehab and replacement needs. The city of St. Louis Park considers the ability of cities to establish housing, housing improvement areas a vital and important financing tool that assists in preserving and improving an important affordable housing resource in our community. The city of St. Louis Park supports making the housing improvement area statute permanent. I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me to um, testify on behalf of this bill. Thank you, Ms. Any questions of this testifier? If not, uh, is there a Mark Sather? Is that the next? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Mark Sather. I'm the city manager of White Bear Lake. And I'd like to start out uh, certainly in favor of, of the, speaking in favor of this bill. I'll talk a little bit about White Bear Lake. It's a city that uh, was founded over 150 years ago. And about every five years, we do a comprehensive survey of our residents. And uh, we ask them, uh, we, 
we focus on the top ten issues in the community, and one of them every year since we started doing that has been our downtown and preserving it. It was, White Bear was a city, an independent, freestanding city long before it became a suburb. It has a strong sense of, of culture and uh, community based in part around a central downtown. 20 years ago, actually about 24 years ago, our downtown was seriously threatened. It had about 40% vacancy, and it was finding that competition from regional shopping malls and, and other new commercial development was, was threatening uh, an important community asset. Uh, the city council, working with downtown merchants and concerned property owners, uh, commissioned a, a study that came back and said one of our, our best opportunities was to coordinate our, our downtown merchants and property owners to compete with those shopping centers by thinking of themselves as a shopping center and to coordinate uh, the hours, the advertising, and a number of things. One of the questions that came up was, well, how are we going to finance that? So it, it had been difficult. Every once in a while we'd have a group of merchants or owners say, well, let's, let's buy new banners for the downtown, and some would pay, some wouldn't, and so forth. So the idea of having a central service district uh, was brought up. And at that time, we were one of those cities that came down and, and sought special legislation for that, and it was uh, approved. And yet it had to be ratified by our city council. When the city council adopted that, they, they had strong concerns, as well as some of the property owners and the merchants. Is this going to be a way of supplanting some of the current taxes and services of the city? Are we just going to end up taxing people more and so forth? And that was, that was very important in, in, for us to, to tie into our system. So even the special bill called for uh, annual, or actually it, it was originally annual, and then it got to a point just because of nuisance doing it every two years, it has to be repetitioned. So we had to have a certain number of petitioners, property owners, to even get it before the city council. An organization called Main Street Incorporated was formed among merchants and property owners in the downtown. They determine how much money is going to be raised through the special assessment, what it's going to be used for. And the city collects it. It, it uh, oversees the disbursement of those funds so that if someone is concerned about that, they can come to City Hall at any time and see the status of that. It's audited along with the city's books and so forth. Out of that has come a, a number of, of very successful programs in terms of, of uh, marketing activities, some of the promotional uh, effects, marketing in major metropolitan newspapers and so forth and magazines for the downtown. Uh, that, that way of funding things like banners and uh, holiday uh, improvements and, and so forth in the downtown has been very effective. Our downtown, I'm happy to say, 20 years, 25 years later, is no longer 40% vacant. It's, I, I think our street level uh, stores right now are nearly fully, uh, vac or fully filled, and it has expanded a great deal during that time. So it's thriving. I think uh, part of it was the funding of this program. But part of it is this program uh, brought together merchants and property owners with, with a common need. And through that came this organization that's very democratic. It elects its, its officers. It petitions the city council council for this amount and it, it's been successful. Um, if, you, if you have, I, I have actually, we've invited the past president and one of the uh, current very active members of Main Street who is a property owner and a merchant in our downtown area. Yeah. Who, so you're not just hearing from city officials, but these are the guys that are actually paying the taxes, if you'd like. Uh, uh, perhaps unless there's, that, that would conclude my remarks, Mr. Chair, and uh, with your indulgence, if I could call on Dale Grambush from our Main Street Association. Um, go ahead and call him, Mr. Grambush, you said? Grambush. Grambush, Grambush. okay. Dale? My ears are a little tired this morning. <laughs> Mr. Grambush, uh, state your name for the tape and then proceed, and then we have some questions of I think my name is Dale Grambush. I'm uh, thank you, Chair and members, for allowing me to speak. I'd just like to say about uh, 10 years, I live currently in White Bear Lake, and about 10 years ago, or 91, we actually moved our office. I have an insurance agency. My dad and I moved to what we, I like to call this beautiful downtown White Bear Lake. And I would concur with Mr. Sather when back in 91 we looked at, there were a lot of opportunities, a lot of open, a lot of for rent signs in the downtown area. If you uh, have been to White Bear Lake recently, you would not see as many for rent signs. And one of the tools I believe the city has really used is the special service district. It's uh, a couple of key things I believe that help with, uh, with the use of the special service district is it allows us to brand our town. So we've been able to take um, 
funds and brand downtown Wiper Lake through uh, radio or TV ads, um, newspaper. It helps us to advertise as a group also. And, um, and one of the true benefits of is that the administration of those is done by a committee. And that committee gets together about once a month where we talk about promotional ideas for the downtown. And in that group, it allows business owners to get together, shop owners and business owners. And you get to know each other. Um, that's where when maybe you go get your hair done, you find out where the best sh shop to get that unique gift for your birthday is. And maybe when you're in that unique shop to uh, find an uh, item, that store owner will tell you about an insurance agent that they had a good relationship with. And maybe the insurance agent is going to lead you to that restaurant where you can have a nice lunch. And the restaurant's going to tell you about the event center where you can hold your next wedding or maybe corporate dinner. You know, I would hope that you would uh, continue to support this bill. <coughs> I think that ends my comments. Thank you, Mr. Graham, Graham Bush. Um, Representative Kwam, you had a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, and this is a great, uh, great program, and I'm, I'm hearing some wonderful results, and I can understand why the, the chief author and uh, the chair and uh, others have, have signed on because they, they like this, and I am really pleased that the city of White Bear Lake has had this history of you know, 25, 20 years, a great deal of input of, of success. But I also heard uh, uh, Mr. Sather mention that periodically you go back, whatever, five years and, and, you know, verify what you're doing is consistent with what you need now. So you make tweaks and corrections. And um, would your, you know, Mr. Sather, would, would your success be uh, the same if you didn't go back and periodically uh, look to see if what you're doing is continuing to be the best thing? Mr. Sather. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Kwam, I, I believe there's, in terms of the time, we, we go back every five years and, and petition or survey all of our residents, but every two years under our current arrangement for the Special Service District, the organization, Main Street Incorporated, must come back and petition the city council for the, the continued assessment. So that was one of the conditions that the city council signed at the beginning. And I do think that that was important, particularly at the beginning, because there was some fear that, wait a minute, this will just become another form of <coughs> taxation, or the city will now start dumping some of its other costs on, on, the, on the downtown area, where we really wanted to use this to, to assist the merchants and the property owners in taking the downtown further than we did. So uh, I, I think in terms of how we've set it up locally, I do believe uh, if I'm responding to your question, if I understand your question right, that it would be important for us. If we just said we're going to adopt this and it's going to be at that level forevermore, we probably wouldn't have the support of those paying the tax. But sometimes they come back and say uh, we'd like to increase it, and sometimes they say, you know, times are a little bit tough. At this point, we'd like to, to keep it at the same level or lower it. They feel that they are in control of that, and I believe our mayor and council want them to, to have that control. Representative Kwam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, again, Mr. Sather, I'm, I'm very pleased with what you've done and the success and the, uh, the way you've uh, supported your community, you know, by listening and, and readdressing. And it reminds me of Malcolm Baldridge type continuous improvement. Uh, even though it has worked well for you in the past, you look how to do it better. And, um, I really like the underlying in, intent here. Uh, the only concern I might have, uh, in a, and I can probably maybe have a conversation offline with the chief author, is um, my general philosophy is even if it's great and I support it, I'd like us to be forced to come back and look at things, not just so that we can, you know, have them expire. But mainly, if something's working, uh, to reaffirm that or expand it or improve it, and that is my only reluctance with this, you know, this bill and this program is, you know, that we would take with the repealer 
that review activity. Representative Simon. Mr. Chair, I think I know where Representative Quam is going, and I actually agree with where he's going, and I anticipate this from Representative Pepin, who's kind of the sunset champion of the legislature, and I've, I've, I've signed on to many of her uh, sunset bills, and I generally support sunsets. Here, to me, anyway, is the distinction. I think when you're talking about a state program, when it's St. Paul, top-down, one-size-fits-all, command and control from this building, um, then I think it's more appropriate, particularly where it's a regulation. Let's say we say, um, you know, if you produce a certain chemical, it can only be X parts per billion or something like that. Then I think it's appropriate in many cases, not all, but in many to do a sunset. Is this regulation, this one size fits all, you got to do it regulation or program or, or uh, uh, entitlement of some kind. I like sunsets a lot. Here though, where it's not that, it's an authority that folks are already using that it's at the local level and is at their discretion. Then I'm less hot about sunsets. I say if it's working, just let the locals do it. And also, we as a legislature can always revisit it, whether it's in response to some perceived abuse or whatever. We can always yank the thing altogether or hold hearings every three years or four years on whether it's working or whether cities are taking advantage of it. That's just my opinion. It may not be yours, but that's how I see the... Um, distinction here. So I, as I'm sure Representative Pepin can attest, and this may not persuade her on this bill, but you know, I've signed on to many of her bills, and that's the distinction I make. So. Representative Plum, Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Simon, um, thanks for your comments. I probably won't be supporting this today because I do prefer sunsets, but um, just to your last comment, and I, I do appreciate the ones that you've sunset, because I do think it's our job to make sure that we're always uh, making sure that all of our programs, services, anything that we do is looked at and that we're always getting the best bang for our consumers and we're always doing right by them or by our, our um, citizens that we represent. Uh, the only thing I would say for this and your distinction as to why it's different is, yes, we can always revisit it, but, but my experience here is that we won't because there's too many things here that it makes it difficult for us to remember and have a list of all the things that should be revisited. So appreciate what you're doing, and uh, I just wanted to make that comment. Fair enough. Representative Driscoll. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'll just ask Representative Simon, and he can maybe defer some of the questions that I'll have to, to some of the, his testifiers or, or others that he sees as um, maybe having knowledge on the topic. First question is, why is TIF not a, an option on this? the tax income and financing, particularly with the, the example that we had from White Bear Lake. Representative Simon. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I think I will defer, if I, I can, to those who are really in the field. And maybe Mr. Vander already or someone else could handle that. It's a good question. I see a help, uh, phone of friends coming down. Please identify yourself for the tape and um, try and answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Patrick Hines with the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, the, I think the, the important distinction in the housing improvement area is that the capital improvements being funded are actually privately owned properties. They are the actual condominium units and the um, uh, common elements, and so um, traditionally it's been done through housing improvement area because it's those people who are paying their assessments. It's in essence a replacement for the special assessment power that a condominium association would have. Um, I don't know if that, does that answer your question at all? Representative O'Driscoll. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do understand the fact that a lot of these might be CICs under Minnesota's Common Interest Ownership Act and uh, or, or other um, uh, properties of that nature. Um, specifically, I was, I was concerned about the, the use of that in the commercial area. I understand it in the residential because it is private infrastructure. But we are talking about uh, many of the things that White Bear Lake was, was talking about, those seem to be public improvements that we would be looking at uh, in there. And I'm kind of wondering why tax increment financing wouldn't be an option or a choice there with a 40 percent vacancy as was, was suggested. Um, now lower vacancies that would seem to generate additional tax revenue. That's kind of the idea behind a TIF. So this is wanting more on the commercial application. I apologize. I I was answering in the 
concept of the housing improvement area, not the SSD. I'll let White Bear Lake answer that. Mr. Sather. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Driscoll. Actually, in downtown White Bear Lake, we've used both. The uh, tax increment has been used for some infrastructure improvements. We've had to do storm sewer, utility improvements, uh, sidewalk and street improvements, ornamental lighting. So that's, that's has, as uh, Mr. Hines pointed out, that, that worked very well for the public improvements. But a lot of our special service district revenue actually goes more for operational kinds of things. It's, it's collective marketing in, uh, as I mentioned, regional magazines and um, even radio. Uh, it, it's been banners and things that would generally not be used for tax increment because they're relatively short-lived. Um, but I would say generally 100% of our improvements or the, the, the activities that are funded with the special service district, I'm not aware would, number one, qualify as eligible tax increment expenditures. And number two, uh, to, to a great extent, even when a shop is vacant, it's still paying taxes. Once we fill it up, we help that person pay their taxes a little bit more, but we don't see a lot of tax increment or incremental increase in taxes simply by helping them fill a store or keeping it financially viable. So they, they do work where we have actually, through some of the expansions I mentioned, as the downtown became stronger, we had private investment that came in and expanded the downtown area. That, that increment, in some cases, was captured for public improvements in that area that supported the downtown, but not the operations of the shops and not the marketing and some of the other activities that go on. Representative Driscoll. Thank you for that clarification. One of the other things I'd like to, to bring to the committee's attention is that this is uh, Minnesota Statute 428, and right next to 428 is 429, and I realize that that's not a revelation uh, in the sequencing of statute. But uh, Minnesota 429 is the Minnesota Special Assessment Statute for things like roads, sewer, water, sidewalks, or other public utilities. And just in a quick way of a background on this, if I own a home and I've lived in that home for, say, 25 or 30 years and the roof has worn out on that home and I need to replace it, I have to hire a contractor to come in and scrape off the shingles and put the new shingles on. And the cost of that improvement may be pick a number, $15,000, $20,000. And that may not increase the value of my home by fifteen dollars or $20,000 for that investment. But the quirky little thing about 429 is that if the sewer and water system in my neighborhood is 25 or 30 years old or the road in my neighborhood is 25 or 30 years old and I need to go back and replace that, the city cannot assess me for the full cost of that if it doesn't improve my value equal to the cost of the special assessment. So if my home has been assessed or appraised at, say, $100,000 and I have to have a fifteen or $20,000 special assessment, the question becomes, does my home go up by $20,000 in value because I'm just repairing or maintaining and uh, keeping the sewer system and the water system and the streets at, at a serviceable level? Very similar to, to the roof on my home. What's starting to happen is the falling values in, in our communities. Um, cities are having to figure out a way to be able to deal with this. They can't assess the full fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, which means it goes back on the general tax roll for those kinds of services because we can't not have sewer and water and these essential services for people, but then the statute says we can't assess those. My question is how does four twenty eight, this uh, self imposed special assessment that's still using the public uh, resources to be able to levy and put this on, on property owners, would we ever run a foul in four twenty eight with the issues that we have in four twenty nine? Uh, Representative Simon. Mr. Chair, Mr. Representative Mr. Driscoll, one thing I can say after <clears throat> working with 429 for 40 years, one of the things you're always afraid of is a successful assessment appeal. So you, you, you invest a great deal of public uh, funds into a project expecting that there would be a successful assessment and then someone challenges that benefit. Um, for years we, we had to defend those assessments. We had 100% track record in being successful, but we spent a lot of money in court defending those, especially if they were large against large commercial <coughs> properties. Uh, with 428, 
you, in a sense, have the phrase we use, you have the consent of the tax right up front. And so the likelihood, you know, there is no likelihood they could appeal if, in fact, uh, we have a group of, if uh, Mr. Grambush comes in with, with their group and says, we would like to have, say, a $100,000 assessment against our downtown area then the people who perhaps don't agree with that have the ability to file a petition with the city council that would cause them to be able to vote on that. Absent that, uh, then you know, there, that is the appeal process. The council has to listen, but once the council arbitrates in a sense that yes, we think there's a vast majority of the people in favor of this, it seems reasonable, we have not heard opposition, we're gonna go forward with this. It doesn't put the city at risk of having to defend it in court. So that, that's also what kind of keeps the, 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 the request of the, like in our case, Main Street Incorporated, honest with all of its members. If, if they're consistent with the objectives of the downtown, if they think the money is being spent for good purposes, it has their support. If it were to get too high, it would lose their support and never get approved by the council. But the fact that they basically have signed on. Under 429, not to get into a lot of detail, but sometimes you can get somebody to petition and waive their right to appeal. In some instances you do that, and this is kind of closer to that, I would say, but it just, it sets up, as I said, not only is it the, the, the ability to raise these funds, but it's the association and the organization that has been formed to make it happen has made our downtown stronger. As uh, Mr. Grambush mentioned, they, they have a committee that meets monthly that comes up with some really good ideas, and we, we believe it's successful just based on the, uh, on the vac low vacancy rate. Representative Driscoll. Thank you for that explanation. If I might, Ms. Dyson, um, in 428, do, you, do we have any kind of belt and suspenders to help to um, provide what the city manager is talking about from White Bear Lake that we wouldn't see challenges on this? My biggest concern is since it is private, that we could have a successful challenge and, and does the law need to have something that would provide that belt and suspenders that's clearly a private uh, request and that by participation in this you would waive your right to appeal or that there would be some documentation to provide the cities and others that are interested in using this tool. Ms. Dyson. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Driscoll, um, as Mr. Sather was talking about, in the City Special Service District Statute 428.09, there is, it, the section is titled Veto Power of Owners. And um, after they've received notice, the potentially affected property owners can testify at the hearing and they can also object in writing um, to, and request to be excluded from the area, uh, which that may be part of the negotiation is that a particular property is excluded. But if the city doesn't agree, the owner then has 30 days to appeal to the court um, to determine that. But the other part is that if 35% if, if, um, or more of the land area that would be subject to the charges or owners um, individuals, business organizations subject to 35% or more of the charges file an objection to the district, um, then it's vetoed. So you have, it only takes 35% of the people in the area or the land area, the percentages are spelled out, but it only takes that 35% to effectively veto the establishment of the district. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Ms. Dyson. It sounds like it's rather consistent with the language in 429 relative to a petition or a, an appeal on 30 days from the uh, levying of a special assessment on that as well. Uh, again, I just as we move forward on this, that is a concern that I have because this legislature will start to hear more from cities and city organizations about the, uh, the limitations under 429. I just don't want 428 to be pulled in sideways and unexpectedly on this. Uh, with creating an, un, un, an unintended consequence for uh, for taxpayers when attempting to try to do what we perceive to be the right thing in, in these uh, home improvement so, uh, and commercial development districts. Thank you. Any further questions? Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A question for Ms. Dyson. Just curious about the, uh, the history of the uh, sunset, uh, maybe the history of the, of the uh, statute and you know how many years between sunsets that type of thing, Ms. Dyson. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Driskowski, the um, as was explained at the beginning of the um, testimony on this, this it's this whole program, both the housing improvement areas and the special service district, started out as individual special laws before the general law was enacted in 1996, and it had an, uh, a, a what do you call it, a sunset provision of. 2001, and every four years since then, it's been renewed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Is there anybody in the audience that needs to testify either for or against the bill? If not, Representative Simon, if you want to do your wrap up. Uh, well, members, I think we've had a good discussion. I know that you have other business before you. Thanks for hearing this. I think I'm hearing pretty universal agreement that people like the program. There's a good faith disagreement perhaps among uh, some members about the sunset issue, but I think we've got at least a good program on our hands that several cities are using to great effect. So that's good news. With that, uh, I renew my motion that House File 350 be passed and re-referred to the Housing Policy Committee. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. The ayes have it. The motion passes. Thank you, members. Um, Representative Dorholt, we have minutes, two sets, minutes from the 5th and the 6th, if you had a chance to look at those. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the minutes from uh, February 5th and 6th. Um, are there any questions or any corrections? If not, all in favor of approving the minutes for, for the meeting of the February 5th and February 6th. Say aye. 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 Opposed? The motions are the bill is passed. Or the minutes are passed. Minutes are approved. Yep. Next bill on the agenda for today is House File 321. Representative Hornstein. Hornstein, um, I'll put. The, I'll make, make the motion that House File 321 be passed and moved to the General Register. Um, refer to the General Register, and I understand you have a couple of amendments here. Yes. That are yours. A2 and A4. And so I'd like to have the committee move those as well. Okay, well, um, I'll move the A2 amendment, and you want to explain what that does to the bill? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, the A2 amendment is uh, language that the uh, Builders Association of the Twin Cities and the uh, City of Minneapolis and the Park Board agreed to. It's just some technical language that, uh, um, you know, will help allow implementation of this legislation. Any questions of the members of, of the amendment? If not, all in favor of the A2 amendment, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is approved. Um, and the A4 amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. The A4 amendment is uh, uh, <coughs> came to us at the advice of counsel, um, Ms. Dyson, and it just uh, addresses the effective date. Um, because this uh, legislation uh, deals with uh, two different municipal entities, uh, this had to be drafted in such a way to comply with the needs of both of those entities. I don't know if Ms. Dyson has any additional comments on that. Any questions of what this does? Um, does I, guess, I got a question. The A1 amendment, is this in place of the A1 amendment then? Um, it also deals with the effective date. It? Yeah, I believe so, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Do we have the A4? We, we don't have it. We don't. It was distributed. It was not in your packet. It wasn't in the original packet. It was distributed. It was distributed. It was a technical amendment to the change of the A1 amendment. Do you have the A4? I have the A4. I think they have distributed the wrong A4 amendment. We have an H90 A4 amendment. Mr. Chair? Representative Captain. I, I just want to clarify that although this amendment was um, Time stamped at 9:55. Uh, 
it was seems to be a technical amendment. So just kind of going forward, in cases where there's technical amendments, we're going to kind of be flexible with the 24-hour rule? Is that inaccurate? Yes. Any further questions? Uh, all in favor of the A4 amendment to put the bill in the way the author wants it? Signify by, by, by saying aye. aye. Opposed? A4 amendment is adopted. So, Representative Hornstein, you want to uh, explain your bill? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, it's great to be back at this committee and served last year, and we had some good times together. So, uh, it's good to be back. Um, I want to just, uh, before I get into the specific testimony, let the committee know some of the legislative history of this. Um, this Minneapolis park dedication fee actually has passed the legislature and has been signed into law twice by the legislature. So this is not a new issue. We've just had a, a series of challenges in implementing this legislation in the city of Minneapolis. The, the latest just deals with some, some legal and technical issues. So um, again, the, the, the policy of this bill has been supported on a bipartisanly in both 2006 and 2008. And uh, 2006 has actually passed through a Republican majority in the legislature and was signed by Governor Pawlenty. In 2008, we passed it with a Democratic majority also signed by Governor Pawlenty. So I am really hoping, Mr. Chairman, third time's a charm here. So, um, uh, and this is going to be very important for uh, uh, development of parks and, and uh, the overall quality of life in the city of Minneapolis. So, um, House File uh, 321, as amended, is, uh, again, as I mentioned, a technical fix to a bill that's passed twice in, in 06 and 08. Um, Minnesota law, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, gives cities the authority to dedicate land or collect park dedication fees to help pay for local parks. Uh, such fees can only be used for acquisition of land or capital costs and cannot be used for operations or maintenance purposes. The law also requires that a nexus exists between properties paying the fee and the location of the park, among other things. The existing state law is geared towards newly subdivided land, which is a non-existent thing in Minneapolis. So that's why we had to come to the legislature the first time around. So several years ago, the city of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, which is an autonomous elected body uh, in, in the city of Minneapolis, wanted to enact the park dedication fee to help pay for local parks in areas where new housing units were being built. And if you've visited uh, Minneapolis, particularly some of our downtown areas and along the riverfront and by Target Field, you'll see a lot of those new housing units. Um, since the existing law specifically referenced new subdivisions, it was unclear whether Minneapolis could implement such a fee on new housing units um, built on previously developed properties. So that's one of the technical issues we had to deal with. In 2006, the legislature passed a law clarifying that Minneapolis and the Park Board could jointly adopt an ordinance to enact a park dedication fee. The City Council and Park Board began developing such an ordinance, and in 2008, the legislature passed that second bill uh, to make sure that the proposed park dedication ordinance uh, complied with state law. So that brings us to now. And so since the, the first bill was passed in 08, as many as 10,000 housing units have been built in the city. Uh, this development has occurred mostly in downtown Minneapolis, uh, near the University of Minnesota, and along the light rail transit uh, corridors. Uh, these are all areas uh, where there is a lack of parkland. Uh, there's a desperate need for park amenities in these parts of the city. And this park dedication fee will provide the city and the park board uh, with resources to renew our parks. Uh, many cities in the state, including most cities in the metro area, I believe 90% of the municipalities in the metro area use the same sort of land dedication or park dedication fee. So we only want for Minneapolis what most of the rest of the region has already. So here's what we're doing this third time around. On uh, page one, uh, there are changes to current law so that the city and park board are given a direct grant of authority to implement the fee while still adhering to the basic restrictions and requirements imposed on other cities, including the nexus provisions. This is what was discovered uh, by, I think, a variety of attorneys uh, for both the park board and the city when we tried to implement this in 2008. So this corrects that issue. Um, the amount set by ordinance is $1,500 per unit and $200 per new employee in commercial units. 
The second change on page one, which is lines 12 and 13, makes it clear that the fee is charged in conjunction with the issuing of a new building permit. The third uh, change, which is page one, lines 16 and 17, sets the fee at a flat rate per new residential unit, which I mentioned before is $1,500. The fourth change, which is page one, line 20, ensures that we meet the nexus and other requirements of the larger state park dedication law. And we drop the words imposition and application in those words, uh, in, as those words fit uh, the state law. And that was, again, the, some of the language that was suggested to us to, by um, uh, stakeholders. Uh, lastly, and then on the advice of House research, we have that um, uh, amendment uh, that we already incorporated uh, related to the effective date. And I want to thank, we have two great uh, park board members uh, with me here today. Uh, to my right is Carol Kummer. Uh, who has served, uh, many of you may know her, she's uh, been on the staff here at the House for many years and has been on the park board for the better part of, I think, almost uh, 10 years. Uh, also served on the Met Council, so many of you know Carol, and, uh, and yes, and, uh, and I wanted to thank her again publicly because she's uh, uh, retiring from her position this year and has done incredible work. So she'll be testifying, but I also want to introduce Anita Tabb, who's a, uh, also a member of our elected Minneapolis Park Board. Uh, and I'm uh, very glad to have both of them with me today. So um, I'm going to call on Ms. Kummer now to give her testimony. Ms. Kummer, uh, state your name for the tape and pl please proceed. Welcome to the committee. Thank you and good morning, Chair Nelson and committee members. Uh, my name is Carol Kummer and uh, I am a commissioner that re represents a district that has many of those uh, newly developed areas along the light rail line that need this particular legislation. I also have had the privilege of chairing the uh, Intergovernmental and Legislative Committee for the Park Board during, I believe, all of my tenure on the board. And uh, of course, I got that as a result of um, having spent 22 years as a staff of the legislature. And some of my fondest memories, of course, are as a committee administrator to this governmental operation committee. Of course, made up by different folks, except possibly for one. I think Representative Kahn was uh, one of the original <laughs> early members of that committee when Representative Simino uh, was the chair of GovOp. Um, Representative Hornstein has done an excellent job of laying out the reasons for this, the history of it, and uh, also um, our sincere hope that this year it uh, finally does come to fruition. Every day we read in the paper that more and more development is about to occur and uh, it would really be a shame for all the land that could, uh, and the land that could possibly be used for parks uh, is covered over in development that we can no longer access. So uh, I would like to introduce uh, Commissioner Anita Tabb who also represents an area who has similar issues in it. And, and Ms. Tab, before you go start your testimony, um, we have a group of 7th and 8th graders here visiting us today. They're from the Friends School of St. Paul, and we'd like to welcome to our, our committee. And Ms. Tab. Uh, thank you, Chair Nelson and uh, committee members. And introduce yourself for the tape, please. My name is Anita Tab. I am also a commissioner on the Minneapolis Park Board. And I, um, I think it's particularly appropriate here for me to speak because I'd like to provide an example. Uh, I represent a park district for whom this legislation is particularly appropriate. If you're familiar with the new Twins Stadium, it's located in a neighborhood known as the North Loop neighborhood. This relatively new neighborhood is also known as the Warehouse Historic District. It features a remarkably intact concentration of commercial buildings designated by the city's leading architect and, and architects and engineers, or designed by the city's leading architects and engineers. Wholesalers found it a natural location to concentrate warehouses just north of the Central Business District where land values were relatively low and rail lines were nearby. By 1920, approximately 300 warehouse businesses were located in Minneapolis. Needless to say, parks were never a part of the landscape in the early part of the 20th century. 
Now, fast forward to the 21st century, and you'll see a booming residential neighborhood surrounded by the popular, or surrounding the popular Twin Stadium and hosting some of the hottest new restaurants and best chefs in Minneapolis. The number of residents between 2000 and 2010 in this area has tripled. And the young people who, considered, who were considered risk takers when they originally moved to the area have come to love its convenience, have gotten married, have had children, and stayed. So the entire complexion of the area has changed. But again, it was where a warehouse district and there were never any parks in this area. So it's truly underserved in terms of park space. Recently, the neighborhood and the park board commissioned a feasibility study to determine the best place for park space in the neighborhood. We've got several possibilities, but funding a new park is a very expensive venture in the downtown Minneapolis area. So this legislation really provides exactly the type of tool we would like to aug augment the necessary infrastructure necessitated by growth. I would ask you to support this and would be We'd all be delighted to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Tab. And uh, Representative Quam, you had a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, and, and I'm really pleased to hear that uh, revitalization was, was facilitated by uh, some of this activity. Looking at here, I see a few places where the word may is present, and one being new language of the cash fee may be set at a flat rate uh, so I'd, I'd like to understand the alternative since it is is may and then I will randomly select I'm not familiar with all the projects that's going on in your city I'll randomly select a future project uh, that I've heard about a, a Viking Stadium and would like to understand what fee that project has Representative Hornstein well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and um, Representative Plum. And specifically to your question about um, page one, line 16 and 17, that language is in there because it's um, we, we had not um, set uh, the fee at a specific um, at a specific rate, and so that was fifteen hundred dollars per unit. It's my understanding, but I you know know Mr. Workman or Mr. Rice. Could... Yeah. Excuse me. Mr. Chair and committee members, and I think the other thing to be aware of is if a developer would purchase a particular purchases a particularly large piece of land and would like to donate land in lieu of the fee, that is also an acceptable um, alternative for us too. Uh, what, what we're really trying to get to is open space when we create density. All right. Mr. Rice, did you? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Brian Rice, I'm the attorney for the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. I think that uh, Commissioner Tab had it right about the May, the ordinance. Uh, the, the legislation allows for either a dedication of land or a flat fee, and so we think the word was appropriately chosen as May um, for um, per new residential unit because you, it also could be the developer could choose to have it as a land dedication as part of their development. They might set aside a certain parcel of a development for a, a small pocket part. Um, with respect to uh, Representative Quam's question about the Viking Stadium, um, I, I can't provide an exact answer. I do have a copy of the ordinance, and the ordinance for uh, new commercial development is expressed in terms of number of new jobs created, permanent new jobs. And I don't, I, I think that would be the metric that would apply to the Viking Stadium. And I'm not sure how many permanent new jobs the Vikings are adding at the stadium. I don't think it would be very many, however, um, because you've already had a stadium on the site. And there's, it, 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 the ordinance would only apply to new net housing units. So if you tore down one house and put up a house on the same site, there's no fee. If you tore down a house and put up two, a duplex, there'd be one fee of $1,500. On the case of the Viking Stadium, we're basically tearing down a stadium and putting a stadium back. And I don't have any analysis if there's any new new net permanent jobs at the new stadium. Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, thank you for enlightening. So my understanding, correct me if I'm uh, incorrect, 
is that you either pay a fee, you know, the may allow us to pay a set fee, uh, have the fee waived, or at the option of the developer to donate land in lieu of a fee, there is no variability of where, in a special instance, you're, you would require a developer to do something more. So if I'm correct in that, that interpretation, you don't have to say anything. And uh, thank you for the information. Representative Hornstein. Thank you. I mean, I no quote you. Just Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I know the answer to this question, but just sort of for my own security, just wanted to make sure and for the record. Um, not all of the land uh, run by the Minneapolis Park Board is actually located in the city of Minneapolis. Um, and I, so I assume that this, that this uh, if this change is enacted, it would apply only to those portions of the of Minneapolis Park Board territory that are within the city of Minneapolis boundaries. Uh, Mr. Rice. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Freiburg, you are correct. It's a joint ordinance of the Park Board and the City Council of Minneapolis, and their jurisdiction is limited to the, because it's a joint ordinance, that only, and the, the City of Minneapolis's geographical uh, authority is just with inside the corporate limits of Minneapolis. You, you would be correct. For, for the committee to know that there, there's a the, the park board owns uh, two golf courses outside the city limits and uh, a large, uh, actually three golf courses and uh, outside the city limits and a lot of land in Representative Freiburg's district, Theater Worth Park, which is natural and uh, is not, uh, and there are no plans to do any housing or commercial development and uh, the land's held in trust for the public and uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Representative Hornstein, I believe we've heard this bef this bill before. Um, I think we passed the three year contract. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and I, you know, I was in a, on a park board in my small community years ago. And um, I remember that we were, I think Representative Hornstein, you said 90% of the yeah. cities use this or some figure like that. And I remember we, we did. You know, we did impose park fees on developers, and my recollection is it was sort of random about, well, how much do we charge this developer? Well, maybe X percent, maybe Y percent. Do we like them? Do we don't? So that was always a concern to me back then. Um, so, so generally, I get where you're going with this. I, I'm one thing I'm just kind of struggling with is just kind of understanding what different funding sources are available for Minneapolis parks. Maybe someone could clarify that. Is there, um, do the Minneapolis parks get any LGA specifically from the city of Minneapolis for parks? Um, are there any GO bonds for Minneapolis parks? Um, have Minneapolis parks tried to get legacy money? Do they qualify for legacy money? I'm just trying to get a financial picture of what the, um, the needs are for the parks versus what money is already available. It's kind of a broad question, but I'm just trying to kind of wrap my arms around that. It looks like you're yeah, queuing up to answer that. Commissioner Tapp. Chair Nelson, Representative. Um, I'm going to try to remember what all you had asked there, but um, we do have many funding sources. We do get some legacy money. We, um, we do sometimes issue bonds. In the case of the kinds of parks most likely, though, that we're talking about, they are probably neighborhood parks. So for example, the example that I gave in the North Loop slash Warehouse District, that would be considered a neighborhood park and we, we are not allowed to use regional park money for those kinds of parks. Um, frankly, we're a fairly conservative fiscal organization. We generally don't um, we generally don't bond unless we have a steady stream of income to pay for the interest of those bonds so that we don't saddle our the future commissioners with any kind of obligation which they may have difficulty paying. Um, we do get some monies from, um, I think you asked about LGA, we do get, so the, so the city of Minneapolis gets LGA money and we get a small portion of that LGA money. Most typically this would come from um, property tax 
monies that would go for uh, any kind of small neighborhood parks. And frankly, as I'm sure any of you in your own districts are aware, that's always a struggle. And we're, we've been very, um, I think, careful and frugal in how we look at property taxes and what we do in terms of property taxes. So that we, uh, I mean, we want to make Minneapolis a place where people can live. And um, so it, the, the financial piece of it is always um, interesting and I struggle. <laughs> Representative Tappan. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Tab. So just to clarify then, um, maybe you could, you said a small portion of LG. I'm just wondering what that dollar amount is. And then I think you said that you do get some legacy money, but that typically doesn't go for neighborhood parks. I guess that question might be for um, Representative Kahn, um, about, or, or maybe perhaps someone else could answer about whether legacy money can be used for neighborhood parks or if that's out of the guidelines of legacy. But maybe Commissioner Tab can answer the first part first. Representative. Well, I think one of the things is, is that the Minneapolis park system is part of the regional park system. In Minneapolis, in Minneapolis parks, and it's not available for neighborhood parks. The regional park system is distinctly distinct from the neighborhood park system. Mr. Chairman, Represent or Mr. Mr. Bryce, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, on Representative uh, Pepin's question, the, the park board receives approximately. Um, 11.5% of whatever LGA this, the city of Minneapolis has. That's a historic uh, division uh, between the, the park board and the city, and it was based on a percent of property taxes that goes back probably 20 years. Um, on the issue, as I think Representative Kahn answered it, Minneapolis Park Board does receive legacy funds, but there are um, there are only certain parks which are eligible for those legacy funds, and those parks have to be designated by the Metropolitan Council. They have to be uh, natural-based um, open space land. They have to be over a certain number of acreage, and they have to attract uh, the general metric is about half of the visitors to those parks have to be not from the city of Minneapolis. The Met Council tracks that, and so the the parks that would be familiar to most people would be Minnehaha Park, which is the first uh, state park in the declared a state park by the legislature. The Chain of Lakes in South Minneapolis, um, the the Mississippi Gorge all the way from um, Lock and Dam Number One up past uh, West Broadway, um, Theater Worth uh, Park, and. Um, generally the, the 54 miles of parkway called the Grand Round System, which are nationally designated. So they're, they're regional parks, Worth, Chain of Lakes, Minnehaha Parkway, um, the riverfront um, would be those areas. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Rice. That's helpful. Um, I, I guess kind of what I'm getting at, and again, I don't know that I necessarily have a problem with this bill because I know that cities do use this and it is a tool to um, to do some good development projects, um, which is certainly something that you know communities want. They want to have parks and open space and things like that. I'm just trying to get an understanding of, um, we've got some pieces together. I'm trying to get an understanding of the kind of the total dollar amount. You talked about maybe 11.5% from LGA. I realize LGA is a different amount every uh, biennium probably and then y there's a portion from um, legacy so I guess I'm trying to figure out kind of what if a ballpark estimate of the total amount of uh, from all sources of funds that um, Minneapolis parks get and then maybe what what's needed what's outstanding what are your needs that aren't being met Chair yeah. Nelson representative Pepin um, I would. I believe that we get approximately five million through LGA, um, and and that we typically where we struggle would be in our neighborhood parks. Um, we have other funding sources, but they can only be used generally for capital expenditures in our regional parks, um, and and then. Sometimes, again, sometimes we will bond, but only if there's an income stream. So, um, so we're looking at something in the bonding area, but it, again, it, it requires some sort of income stream that's fairly substantial to be able to support that bonding effort. Did I respond to your question? Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Tabb. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the direction I'm going. I, I guess I'm interested, in too, on what your needs are. I obviously haven't looked at your comprehensive long-term plan. I don't have that memorized or anything. I'm just kind of, you know, trying to figure out where you're trying to get and how much how much um, park fees that you need to get there. If you're getting, fi you know, $5 million in LGA plus others, plus additional, um, some additional money from other funding sources, I'm just trying to get an understanding of this is what you get. How, how, do, you, how do you get to... Uh, whatever your long-term plans are, your comprehensive long-term plan, how much more additional funding are you trying to generate from this to get where you need to be? And I, I'm sorry if that's too broad, but I'm just trying to get a kind of a big picture of, of where you're going with this. Ms. Tab. Chair Nelson, Representative Pappas. Um, Pappas, uh, let me just sort of take a stab at it. We um, are, it's hard to answer with a specific dollar number because we don't know where our growth will be. But what we do want to do is to be able to provide the same kinds of infrastructure for our newer and high growth neighborhoods that we have in our, the other areas of town. And we believe that that's important because what that does is it really um, allows for um, the kind of growth and amenities that make people want to move to an area. So for example, in Minneapolis, we've got some areas that are quite wealthy and we have some areas that are not as wealthy. And what we find is, is we try to um, allow for amenities that will make the parts of the city that maybe aren't quite as attractive more attractive to people to come in and want to live there because that helps broaden our base, expand our base, and really is a good thing for, for everybody. So if you're in downtown Minneapolis, um, putting in a pocket park because you've got um, a, an increase in population is going to be significantly more expensive than if you are, for example, perhaps along the Hiawatha line. So I, that's why it's difficult, I think, to put a specific dollar amount on it. Again, some of my neighborhoods tend to be in the downtown area. And land in the downtown area, people, they want a lot of money for that. So that's very difficult for us to finance. And we may, in fact, have to um, add some money from our property tax budget to be able to purchase that sort of land. Whereas we might be able to take the fees that are more in outlying areas of the city if those develop and be able to purchase exactly what we need and add amenities that we need in those areas. So I know that's not a very specific answer, um, but I think that's sort of, a, that's kind of the direction that we're going. Representative Pepin. Mr. Chair and Commissioner Tabb. I appreciate that because I know it's hard to sort of put a, a dollar amount on that, and I certainly think your goal of trying to have good communities throughout the city is is a, a good goal. Um, I wish I had a little bit more financial information. I mean, I I think I'm just kind of also kind of curious. Um, the cash fee may be set at a flat fee rate per net new residential unit. It doesn't give a lot of information on what, what that would be what those, that uh, dollar amount would look like or what percentage it would look like to um, uh, developers. And so uh, perhaps one of the developers will kind of talk about that. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, I guess, put a dollar amount on it or compare it to some other locations because I really, this doesn't give me a lot of information about how much we're asking. A flat fee is great. I just don't know what that looks like. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rice. If I could answer that. The, the city in Representative Pepin, the city and the park board have jointly adopted an ordinance. The ordinance provides for a $1,500 fee per new housing unit. Um, and uh, that's a number that uh, the council and the park board agreed on. And just for the committee's information, the, the city council was uh, most sensitive about that. Initially, we had asked for a fee of about $3,000 per house which would have been about the average of the fee charged in suburban communities around the metropolitan area. So it's about half of what the park dedication fee is in other cities. And <clears throat> I think on your budget questions, Representative uh, Pepin, there'd be, there's two issues there. The Minneapolis Park Board has an annual operating budget of about $55 million. And that's primarily made up of property taxes. Probably over 80% of it comes from uh, property taxes. What we're talking about with legacy funds, legacy dollars have only been used for new capital improvements. They cannot be used to supplement or supplant existing budgets, and they are not used for operations. Those dollars that flow into the system 
which averages about three to four million dollars a year, are strictly to make new capital improvements in regional parks. The dollars from this fee of $1,500 per unit can only be used to build or develop and make capital improvements in parks within the nexus of where the fee was collected, and, and roughly that's a half a mile. There's 81 uh, neighborhoods in the city of Minneapolis. The average population is 5,000. The average size of these uh, neighborhood uh, neighborhoods are slightly over uh, about six tenths of a square mile um, in uh, in size, and uh, the the dollars first have to be used in those individual neighborhoods, and they have to meet the nexus test. So it is truly a fee; it's not a tax. Um, to give you an example, in the last decade, uh, Minneapolis added about 10,000 homes. So the fee on a de uh, per decade basis would add about uh, 15 million dollars. Um, um, and I think the projection for the city of Minneapolis is that for it to add about 20,000 new housing units over the next couple decades. So roughly it would be $15 million uh, a, a, um, a decade, about a million and a half dollars a year. Um, for a city of that size in terms of capital, um, it would be um, if, you know, fairly normal uh, in terms of growth. The numbers are big, but the population is big, and the and the changes. The the particular problem, I think, as Commissioner Tab noted, the the places that are developing um, in the city, the Twin Stadium, light rail lines, and uh, even potentially this new Viking Stadium, if there's a lot of development there, with new housing or commercial areas, are areas where there has absolutely been no parks historically. And so the choice is either you provide a general tax and have all the citizens in the city pay for it, or you not a ta you, you generally tax everyone for an improvement that's specific to uh, an individual neighborhood. And I think the model in Minnesota is this truly is a fee, not a tax. If it's collected uh, locally and you get you're directly benefited by the improvement, and rather than tax everyone. I think the policymakers in the city have felt it's appropriate to put on a fee. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Those numbers are really helpful to help me see the, the big picture. And I was particularly um, interested in the 1500 per housing unit. I think you said it was about half of the suburban area and what the fee was. I was just wondering, I guess my final question would just be, um, what would what do the developers think? Have they given pushback? Do they... Uh, I'm just kind of curious. I don't know that they're here to particularly, you know, comment on. Maybe someone wants to comment. I'm just wondering what they thought of the of the fairness of the fee. But uh, perhaps that's a question for for uh, Mr. Coyle. Or I think Mr. Coyle is moving down here. We can answer yeah. the question quickly. And I just want to. I guess I just c kind of wondering if that's if that's in line. If that if that's a if you would agree with the and the. If we um, be concise, we've got we're run, we're running short of time here and. I've got three more people on the list, and we've got one more amendment here. That Mr. Chairman, I, um, I think one of the things that's easy to see is that all the local legislators are co-authors of Representative Hornstein's bill. It's the easiest comment to make. All the what? But all the local legislators are co-authors of Representative Hornstein's bill. The easiest Mr. Coyle. Mr. Chairman, Representative Pepin, uh, as it's been described by uh, Representative Hornstein and by Mr. Rice and others from the commission, the approach that they're taking is very co consistent with what's used throughout the rest of Minnesota. The fees are actually a little bit below what we might see in some of the high growth suburban areas. So in that sense, it's a value. Uh, and the need certainly is quite apparent in, the, in Minneapolis areas that are growing. So the Builders Association is not opposing this bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Appreciate Clark. it. And Mr. Chair, I have a, um, a chart so people can find their own district. And uh, as Mr. Coyle said, I mean, we're well below some of these. Um, you know, Wyzetta is higher, St. Michael is higher, Shorewood is higher, Norwood Young America, all. Of, so, you know, we're, we're actually a little less than that. And just a couple of comments that I appreciated Representative Pepin's questions. And, um, you know, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board is a independent local unit of government. So, you know, we could provide, if people are interested, the, you know, the pie chart that has the different funding sources and and uh, and income and expenditures, and 
just so people get a sense of what we're talking about, um, you know, we have in my uh, neighborhood a, a very small park that has uh, a couple of ball fields and a children's play area and then a small building where, you know, community events take place. And so all these neighborhoods, as Mr. Rice said, have a park like that. And that's, you know, I have three kids that are grown now, but that, I spent literally half my life in that little small park. And, um, you know, watching the kids on the jungle gym and whatnot. And so this is the, this is the kind of opportunity we want to provide for these new growing neighborhoods. It's that type of, that type of uh, facility, not Theodore Worth Park or, or the Chain of Lakes. And so these are, you know, these are the building blocks. This is where people spend a lot of time and a lot of memories are created. And so this is the, the kind of, um, you know, amenity that we want to create. And I think the builders understand that, you know, that, that enhances their property value to have these types of facilities. There. So, uh, but again, Representative Pepin, I'd be happy to, you know, get that information. So you have a sense of the budget, the income and expenditure pie chart, which I think would be helpful to you given your, your questions. And, and Representative um, Hornstein, uh, do you, there's an H5 amendment here. Do you want that put on also? Do we need to get that put on also? Yes. Um, so I'll move the H5 amendment and, and um, every member oh. should have it, have it passed out to them. Mm -hmm. It's a substitute for the H3 amendment. It's a technical one. Oh, okay. okay. <coughs> Members have it. All in favor of the H5 amendment, please say aye. A5. 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 Did I say, what did I say? H5. H5. I'm sorry. <laughs> My eyes are tired too. Um, A5 amendment. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, the most amendments are just. Representative O'Driscoll, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will be uh, rather succinct with my questions. Representative Hornstein, it's good to see you back at the Government Thank Operations you. Committee again. Um, just in the way of good public policy, because that's what I always try to look at, why are we doing this exclusive for, exclusively for Minneapolis? Why wouldn't St. Paul benefit from this or Duluth or even Representative Dorhold's city of St. Cloud has areas and communities that started as far back as the mid-1800s that we would make this type of a tool available for, for all of our communities in the state of Minnesota? Representative Hornstein. Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative O'Driscoll, that's an excellent question. You know, the reason we have to have this kind of legislation is that we have a, a we are very rare, and I don't know if there's another case of it in the state, where we have an actual independently elected uh, park board that has a number of the same kinds of powers that uh, uh, any local unit of government would have. You know, the ability to levy taxes. Uh, the ability to access, you know, legacy funds, et cetera. The ability to jointly with our city council impose a park dedication fee. So that's what makes Minneapolis unique um, and, and why we need this kind of legislation because we have that independently elected unit of government. And of course, you know, we have a lot of hot button issues in our city and anytime people try to propose, well, let's just merge the park board with the city council or whatever, you know, the the we're very protective of this unit of government and it works very well and I think it's one of the reasons why our park system is one of the best in the country. And, and so, Representative Hornstein, I was told that St. Paul was work, was working on an amendment part, that, but they didn't get it done. So that's why it's only Minneapolis right now. But I Representative think O'Driscoll. And Mr. Chairman, Representative O'Driscoll, there's probably ways in this legislation that uh, the few remaining cities that don't have this might be able to, to, to hop on board. but. You know, that, that may be for later on. But the reason we're before the legislature really has to do with the structure of Minneapolis government. Representative Driscoll. Very quickly, and it will be my final question. Why can't this be accomplished in a development or redevelopment agreement that um, cities use with developers to do some of the streetscape or other kinds of things that are, seem to be mutually beneficial to the, to the project but um, aren't necessarily carved out in statute, if you will, kind of a, of a uh, con contractual agreement that... Um, this is going to happen in these particular areas. Representative Hornstein. I don't know if um, Mr. Rice. Mr. Rice. This is a whole history of this in the state, and, th and that's why we have these 90% of our um, region areas in the region have this. So, but Mr. Rice. Mr. Rice. Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Driscoll, you answer a good question. Again, it would probably go back to the structure of the city government in Minneapolis, which 
it was actually this legislature in 1883, 130 years ago, created the Minneapolis Park Board as an independent entity to deal with parks in the city. And so linking the city council function with the park board function takes the help of the legislature. But it was, you know, this body actually, it's, I think it's April uh, 6th of this year, created the park board to set up a park system independent of city government. <laughs> Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I en enjoy when I learn something new, get new information from testifiers. And one thing that I picked up from the testimony is that uh, the LGA that uh, the Park Board receives is of the same magnitude as the total LGA for uh, Rochester, you know, the third largest city, a city of the first class that's of the same magnitude uh, as, as Minneapolis for population. And I see LGA is uh, for core and, and basic services. So am I, and this is for the director of the park board, am I to interpret then that Minneapolis cares so much for its parks that it considers parks as a basic and core service to the people? Uh, Ms. Tab, yeah. Commissioner Tab. <laughs> Chair Nelson, Representative, I would say that if you polled the, the constituents in, in all of our districts that, yes, I do believe that um, I hear that from my constituents all the time. We live here because we love the parks. I, I can't tell you how many people actually move to the city because they really think that we have a fabulous, fabulous park system. It, it's To me, it's an amazing... Um, Amazingly consistent uh, answer that we get on that kind of a question. Representative Quam. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Hornstein, coming uh, from Mazeppa, um, we our kids play in the hayfield, but uh, yeah. I'm trying to. Li there's kind of a cultural uh, divide here, so I'm trying to look at how we, how to bridge it. I'm, I'm curious how many. I've got a lot of questions, and I don't want to burn up everybody's time here. But how many how many parks are there in Minneapolis? Uh, how many additional parks per year do you build, um, or are you just trying to maintain what's a pocket park? Um, and um, you know, uh, it sounds like these small parks uh, are almost like backyard parks. Where I don't know, we used to have a swing set for the kids. But anyway, those are some questions I have. Commissioner Tab. Chair and Representative, um, when you live in a condo, you don't have a backyard. So what we do try to do is provide a pocket park is just a, a small piece of land. So it might just be a little corner that we've been able to carve out because that's um, an extra little space. And we can put some greenery and some green space there and maybe a park bench so people can enjoy the outside. But again, in the downtown area, we've got a, a, a large number of condos and not everybody has an outdoor balcony or, and, and, or the opportunity to be outside. And again, um, we hope that density is a good thing for the city. Um, it certainly, uh, we certainly think that it is. But with density, we also think we have an obligation to provide some green space for people to be able to get outdoors. As you know, if you're able to play in the hayfields, that's a great thing. And many of our residents have backyards, but many, many, many do not. So this gives people an opportunity, really, to be able to go outside and enjoy. Um, we do have some larger parks that uh, tend not to be in the downtown area. We've got Theodore Worth, which we think is a great park, and we hope you'll all come and enjoy that as well. Um, and that's sort of our equivalent maybe of being able to drive a few miles and get to, to something that really is sort of our outdoor space. We typically don't have lots of land acquisition. It tends to be very targeted, I would say. Um, you know, we're trying to, uh, for both park and economic development reasons, acquire land along the, above, above the falls and at the river front so that we can do some um, good environmental work, as well as some economic development along the north part of our city that really, that really could use a shot in the arm, if you will, from an economic standpoint. Uh, again, we know that parks do help in terms of economic development in many, many ways. Representative Skowski. Um, 
Well, thanks. Just oh, Representative for example, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative yeah. Scassi. So in, in this park in my uh, neighborhood, you know, so the ball field becomes a hockey rink in uh, winter. And on a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon in winter, um, there are literally hundreds of people of all ages, you know, skating around, playing pickup games, you know, and these really become focal points for the, the neighborhood and the community. So these are very, very well utilized small spaces, and I think we get a lot of bang for our buck in terms of, you know, uh, you know people being able to utilize them. Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're about out of time here, but just quickly, we're, if we're I can... We'll go a little bit. We started a little late because the previous committee ran late on us. We're going to go about a, a little late, but we, hopefully we can get it wrapped up here so we can get a vote on this tonight. I, I'm just curious, how, what's, what's the average distance somebody has to go to get to a park? Uh, you know, is it, uh, or what is the goal? Um, maybe you have a goal uh, uh, or an average distance. Just a quick answer. <laughs> Shared representative, the goal is about six blocks or so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions? Anybody from the audience that needs to testify for or against this bill? If not, um, I'll renew my motion that House File 321, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the General Register. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Bill, thank you, Mr. Bill. Chairman and members. Thank you very much. And uh, we had scheduled the DFL caucus for after this, but we've run out of time, so we'll do it hopefully tomorrow after the meeting. Um, with that, we're adjourned. Yeah.